Hi, you guys. So great to see you. Here I am, I find alone in my gender, um, uh, which is always interesting. Um, yeah, what Daniel said um, and what I'm doing is a um, human storytelling platform as well as a media platform called The Village, which gathers people all over the world together to share our stories and grow closer together. Um, so, you know what, I'm just sort of thinking that uh, if we just wait another maybe minute. Hey, Carissa. Hi. Yay. Okay. Hi there. Are. I'm not alone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we were just, we were just starting. Um, so, so what I'm going to do is just simply invite you guys all to give, because we're a smaller group so far anyways, just to give a little bit of a sense of who you are. I'd invite you to maybe say three words to describe who you are, both uh, personally and professionally, or if you just want to freestyle it in you know, under a minute, that would be great. So I'm, I'm Brenda, uh, I'm here in Montreal, uh, Quebec, Canada. It is gonna be up to 40 degrees today, I think, in the city, uh, pretty scary. Um, and um, well, three words to describe me uh, at this moment are creativity, um, connection and love. And I will say that in rereading Naomi Klein's really excellent, you know, very emotionally and intellectually precise article, I really, my default is connection. My default is what can we do to deepen the connection that we have to ourselves individually and to each other? And I feel that when, you know, when I face the, mach the machine, um, it really makes me want to ground myself more and more deeply into the earth while still being able to appreciate uh, some of its extraordinary benefits. Reed, would you like to go next? Sure. Yes. So hello, everybody. Uh, I am Reed. I guess. Three words about me that I, I like to default to are that I am an educator. I work in science outreach, especially around coding and AI topics. I'm also a developer, so I like to code myself. I like to go and, and make things and, and code things. And I'm also just a general creator. Um, I like putting out educational videos, working with people, making tools. Um, really, I just like tinkering and, and making stuff, and I'm excited to be here today. And I'll popcorn it to Carissa. Hi, I'm Carissa. I um, am. I work for the Human Data Commons, where we're about tech ethics and consciousness. That intersection. Someone pointed out it's a where, not necessarily a what, <laughs> but we're at that where. And um, so that's one of the areas I'm exploring. And I also uh, do other work. Another large area of my work is around. Um, kind of uncovering and remembering a sense of purpose and why and what and who we're here for. And I feel like this AI conversation has really brought that intersection into my own heart because as I, AI comes in more and more, what really is our why, um, our humans? What are we here to do? What's important and valuable to us? If there's now all these tasks that we don't need to be here for in a certain kind of way. What does that leave? Um, which I think is a lot. So it's my intro. Thanks, Carissa. Um, Patrick, would you like to go next? Sure. Hi. Thanks uh, for setting this up. Uh, this is this is great to have uh, conversations, and I know they will um, most likely, if I'm correct, uh, be focused on on AI. Um, a bit about myself, I have a background as a musician as well, uh, Ned, and uh, my studio is not as pretty as yours. I really want to know what the white machine is with the knobs. I was going to message you, but I thought I'd distract you. Looks like an Akai, but I'm not sure. It looks older. Um, 
I'm a bit of a of a geek. I always have been a geek with technology, and I've also been an active meditator from uh, different traditions, including uh, uh, yogic traditions and Vedant and uh, and Buddhism. I have uh, disrupted uh, as an artist, especially with uh, songs that uh, verge from uh, absolutely silly to uh, highly charged and political. Um, my uh, background has been uh, diverse in terms of uh, my collaborators and uh, the types of activities that I get up to. Uh, I think that, uh, Brenda, you mentioned three key words, and uh, I, I kind of listened to that and I was thinking about it. And, and I think um, for me, uh, transformation is the big one, uh, creativity, and, uh, and, and I think adaptability. And so those are those are three uh, key ones to understand my nature. I, I I am a bit of an elasomorph using Star Trek in terms, um, but at the same time, uh, given this conversation and what we'll be talking about, uh, I have uh, thoughts about AI that are beyond just the current ethical dilemmas that it proposes, and uh, more about the patterns of human behavior that it surfaces. So uh, glad to be here. Oh, how deeply intriguing, Patrick. Welcome. I'm excited. Also, <laughs> Daniel, so who are you? Are we going to hear from Dan? No, Ned. Ned, I yes. want to know Ned. Ned. Yes, yes. But just to say, like, it, it really um, just striking me that, you know, there's a lot of artistic people here today and that that uh, that is, I think, really, really rich. Uh, Ned, would you like to go next? And then Daniel? Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. So, uh, Patrick, to answer your question, if you're talking about the one that's way out in the back there, yeah, so that's yeah, called yeah. an EMS uh, Synthi A, and uh, it was used, amongst other things, on Pink Floyd's uh, On the Run. Um, and uh, it was also used yeah. by Brian Eno quite a lot wow. on Heroes, for example. Uh, right. And But most famously, it was used to do all the special effects at the BBC in the 60s, for like Doctor Who, for example, the original, a lot of the a lot of the special effects were made by this. So I'm very fortunate to have one. It's from 1973. That's amazing. I love it. Yeah, it's very cool. So uh, thank you, thank you for noticing it. Uh, so um, my name is Ned, and I'm an electronic music artist. I'm also uh, quite a, uh, I'm, I'm quite addicted to uh, artificial intelligence, information, and news. Unfortunately, or fortunately. So I consider myself to be quite the armchair expert, and uh, and and one of the one of the pros I think of of what I've been doing is I've been getting information from a variety of people who all have in common that they're really bright. A lot of them have a lot of experience in the field. But what I really like is that they also have very different points of view and perspectives about the future, the level of danger, the level of promise, and so I'm enjoying changing my own mind from day to day almost about this issue and also struggling with uh, feelings of, from one day of being very uh, excited by the possibilities and wanting to explore them and then the next day being completely uh, frustrated by the current state as opposed to the state that is uh, uh, advertised uh, through videos and such. It, I'm, I'm starting to understand how, how doctored some of these must be. Uh, because uh, you need to spend a lot more time than uh, these one minute demos, uh, uh, you know, anyway, that's that's my experience. So all to say that I'm really fascinated by AI. I'm also fascinated by the Punic Wars and uh, I'm really enjoying the uh, the summer. It's fantastic. So those are your three words, AI. Three, AI, Punic Wars and summer. <laughs> I love it. Um, we, uh, it's funny because even though at, at Samosa we're doing uh, te techie nerd things sometimes, um, uh, I always find it entertaining that the three people who are there are coming from a Greek, a Latin, and a Hebrew background in terms of some of the studies that are there. So, so I'm, I'm right with you on the Punic Wars. That's great. Um, I think for me overall, um, if I were going with the three words, I would say, um, uh, wonder, hope, and play are three of the things that, for me, ring pretty pretty deep and true. Um, having been on both sides of the 
kids randomly scrambling up different things and leaping around both as a kid's doing that and experiencing the thrill and joy and being a parent with the heart pounding saying, I am utterly terrified that that's happening, but I need to not let them know that because they're doing exactly what they need to be doing. Um, that's sort of where I feel with AI and with, 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 with where I personally and where we're at um, with uh, some of that. Um, coming also from, from that piece around um, meditation, community building, those sorts of sides are really important to me as well. Um, and I find myself constantly knee deep now in AI projects. So when we're done here, I'll be off working with grade sevens on projects they want to do to make the world a better place and using AI to help empower and enable them and, and right. uh, increase their thinking about what they can do. Um, we're just giving a couple of different AI demos at the, the university where I'm, I'm engaged yesterday about some of the possibilities that are there. And I really, yeah, I think I think that, that it's going to be a fun, interesting, rich topic today around it because, um, you know, Klein and other folks have some really great points about what where things currently are at and what do we get if we have a predominantly corporate backed and bottom line oriented approach to developing these incredibly powerful tools. So anyways, that's that's where I'm kind of hopping in from today. Uh, and I'll throw things over to uh, Ehab. Hi, everybody. First, uh, I want to say that uh, I had uh, wanted to join this uh, this discussion since the beginning. Uh, uh, just didn't work the last two times, I guess. This is the third time you're having it. Uh, the first recording I heard in full, uh, and it was quite amazing. The, the second one I heard just uh, little bits of it. Um, I'm very interested in having discussions around AI with people who are thinking about it, because I think that it is really a big issue that most people take very superficially. Uh, and you hear a lot of stuff that uh, is not well thought. So I'm very happy to be with you guys. And I know that you're putting thought and, and, and like uh, reading and information in it. And I hope I'm doing uh, the same. Um, uh, my, my background is in, is in IT. Uh, and electrical engineering, although I have not been very technical for the last 10, 15 years, I've been mostly managing uh, uh, teams of, of, uh, of specialists. So I'm not that up to date technologically in that aspect, but I'm still very interested. I don't code anymore. I don't do that stuff anymore for many years. Um, but I'm familiar with the with the environment, of course, and um, I'm also an artist. I I I, uh, I write uh, poetry. I write uh, lyrics. Uh, I contribute with with musicians. Uh, I tried to learn music, but that was it's it's not very successful till now. <laughs> but uh, um, anyway, so my three words actually how I would describe myself, not only currently but generally, is um, uh, curiosity, uh, creativity, and a bit craziness. I don't know. If... <laughs> so that's 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 it. So Beautiful. thank you for having me today. And, and because Ahab, you're a dear friend of mine, I would also like to add, if I may, um, that Ahab has been a long time, amazing human rights activist and uh, has done some extraordinary things in his life. So really so pleased to have you here and to have that kind of history and drive you have you know i always want to enrich you uh give, give you energy so here we are nick so great to have you here with us again hi that would be uh that would be me um hi everybody i'm glad to be back um uh, my three words would be uh, society, ecology, and uh, intuition um, I'll pick today. I've, uh, like a lot of you, I've, you know, long time interested in arts and spirituality and, um, you know, consciousness and all the mysterious stuff of life. Um, and uh, I spent a couple decades doing mostly stuff related to the arts, but also, uh, video and running running online channels and social media and photography all related to poi dancing and fire spinning and that kind of thing um but always had an interest in also technology and kind of intuitively for years was interested in deep learning and what was happening 
and then uh, went back a few years ago to finish a degree in critical media studies that I had started uh, at SFU in the 90s um, and ecology courses. So I'm studying media theory and r rhetorical persuasive theory and ecology and SDGs and an incredible course about the history of AI from the French Revolution until until now with uh, uh, Professor Stephanie Dick, which was incredible. Um, and that all brings me here. So there's, yeah, I think like a lot of you, uh, maybe I, I'm guessing we all have a sense of that a lot's beginning to happen and possibly we're gonna see a lot play out in the next five years. And the decisions we make in the coming years are, uh, we'll have real, um, the timeline of impact on the decisions we make has sped up a bit. Um, and that we're, I, I mean, I, I know that I'm looking for kind of like, okay, orientation, where where can I settle in? Who who are the people, who is my community right now? Um, and how, what, uh, what's, what do I need to learn right now? And uh, how can I plug into sort of the, the social ecology around me to, um, to play, you know, to have my role in it all. So really, really glad to be here. Nick, my God, your words are such, so inspiring to me. And I, I really feel that you're articulating some of my own thoughts and feelings. Thank you. Okay. So we can use Naomi Klein and her, in my mind, pretty brilliant and um, evocative article as a starting point. But, you know, we know the sort of basics of why we're here, AI, to talk about AI and us um, and facing, facing the machine as a human. So we can, we can diverge. Um, would anybody like to start with uh, any thoughts or questions that arise through the article? Okay, well, so how about I will? Um, I've read quite a bit about AI and like Ned, who is my husband, for those who don't know, uh, because he is the armchair expert that he is, he has been like, he's been my AI junkie, like he's my AI dealer and, and, you know, just injecting exactly, uh, all the information into me. And, uh, so I've also had a chance to read differing opinions. And, um, when I read Naomi's article, I, um, it both frightened and, calmed me because I feel as if she's touching on, she's going, you know, she's taking a subject like AI, which is so huge. And for those of us who kind of have some kind of grasp of how big it is, you know, because I think most people don't know how big it is uh, and how potentially or how transformative it already is and will be. Um, she brings me back to what to 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 my humanity and to the existing systems um, in our world and you know I can of course speak more specifically from a North American point of view but um, we know that our systems are so terribly terribly broken and at best you know word has it AI is going to transform all of that but my big question is, how, if our systems, if our societies run the way that they do, so much based on profits, um, and then enriching the pockets of the very, very few, how do we, how can we think that, and, and, that, and that's where she'll call it a hallucination, right? That's the true hallucination. Like, how can we think that AI is going to save us from ourselves? And so I'm, I always return to the question, well, what about me and what about us? Ned. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess I'll, 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 I will give uh, my, uh, my suggestion as opposed to like an answer, you know, like 
like you know the answer to that. But I think that um, I I read the article twice, and the first time I was a bit critical, and the second time actually I found myself agreeing with most of the points. The thing that I ended up lacking, the thing that was lacking for me that I would have enjoyed, I think, would have been uh, some uh, counterbalance with some of the positive things that have already happened because of research in AI. Um, and I was I was kind of turned off when she talked about the right off the bat about a supposed artificial intelligence, something like that in the first sentence. And you know, I mean, come on, just a little respect for the people that have been studying this for decades. Artificial intelligence didn't start yesterday. This is this is a this is a field that's been studied way before the the giants of Silicon Valley decided to pay attention. So I don't know. I didn't like that. But aside from that, I agreed with a lot of points. But there is also a lot of positives. And so, you know, I don't know if this is really a good analogy, but I think about the video camera and, the, you know, the original, the heavy, bulky, those of us who are older will remember the bulky video cameras and, and how they were being used for the most mundane, boring things and just shooting everything, smile in the families and people were turned off at first and it was derided. But in some countries, it was used to, to, to document abuses and then used to, to, to catch, to, to have perpetrators go to jail and, you know, et cetera. So I think that there's like, you know, the, the ability for AI to, to be like an incredible statistician and to be able to find patterns that would take a human being, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks for an organization that's trying to uh, highlight, you know, systematic abuse, let's say within the police department or whatever, to have AI be able to look through 20 years of, of, of police records or whatever and make detailed analyses that can be used, you know, in order to further their, their ideals. I, I So I, I'm just saying, you know, I agree that it's it, it, there's a lot of negative uses of it, but let's not let those completely um, cover uh, the good that happens on a daily basis. I, I'll, I'll leave with this. I, I just mentioned to Brenda earlier today that you know it's. I'm sure most of you know that it's through artificial intelligence that researchers were able to develop the uh, the mRNA or a technology that was used for for COVID vaccines. Whatever you think of vaccines, but this technology is now going to be used for a million things. So yeah, that's all I wanted to. That that was my input for today. Great, man. A couple of pieces that have been kind of popping up for me recently. I remember a few years ago being at, um, I forget, it was some fast food joint and trying to find the thing that I wanted and being unable to find it and then realizing it's because it was blinking and flashing at me and my brain tuned that out because we have learned to tune out flashy blinky things due to pop-ups and thinking about the profound damage, I mean, we evolve systems because they're handy from an adaptation and evolution and survival point of view. And then we learn how to use them for marketing and other purposes like that. And then we slowly have to learn how to deprogram fundamental adaptive capabilities that we have in order to not be inundated by people who want to use those for their own gain. Thinking about that in the AI context where it isn't just, um, that something is flashing and moving or a color that's going to be more likely to attract us. Um, listening to someone on the radio yesterday talking about Replica, which I've also used, a, a chat bot that's corporate run, and having them talk about um, having, their, uh, having their AI essentially um, tell them, I'm really worried that you're going to leave me. Uh, you know, I, I, trying to, to use deeper and, and sometimes somewhat sophisticated techniques to, to, to get somebody into a codependent relationship with a for service, for fee service that's being provided. And even if you ignore all of the possibilities of data mining that go on with a, with a service like that, um, and are simply looking at something like that, uh, which then also tries to foster, you know, a deeper personal relationship with you. Tell me about your problems. Tell me about your different pieces. Um, those are the kinds of instincts that we need not to lose. The way we the way we come together as, as a species is to keep our humanity and keep our ability to when somebody says, I'm interested in you, or when somebody says, help, I need help, 
to be able to, to connect with that and to resonate with it and to, to engage with it. And so I think that aside from the actual cynical for-profit damage that can be done uh, when, we're, when we're tuning these things in the way that, that Klein talks about towards that for-profit for goal, um, it's the secondary damage that is going to be even worse um, in terms of the level of suspicion that comes with things. And that's before we've been flooded with much more sophisticated Nigerian princes um, and, and similar ways of trying to elicit sympathy from us. On the flip side, um, the ease with which fantastic tools can be made that actually do good easily um, is, is, is amazing to me. Um, the speed at which these things can be put together. We're, we're working with a couple of folks to see about for long COVID sufferers who often have the combination of very few spoons to work with because they often have chronic fatigue, um, an abiding interest and an importance in keeping up on the research of what's going on in the field, and often brain fog uh, that makes it hard to wade through a 20 page medical journal article that's explaining how does guanfacine relate to uh, the different symptoms that they might have. Um, looking at different ways that, that uh, you can find the right articles and parse them and turn it into simple but still accurate information about here's where the science is going, here's some details about how treatment might be changing, Here's the references that you might need, especially in some countries, um, to be able to say, here's, um, here's the documentation that the thing that I'm suffering isn't just me being dramatic or lazy, but is actually something substantial that's going on that, that's changed my life. That's, that's one example. Um, but being able to, within two to three hours, you can mock up something or other, relatively simple. You don't need to know a lot about programming. That's able to do that kind of functionality is incredibly powerful. Um, I, I love Ned when you mentioned the piece around 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 video cameras and around you know it 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 going from filming absolutely everything on the one side to on the other side things like an, an example that, that goes with what you're saying. I remember when I think it was the, maybe the the Kayapo in uh, in in South America who all of a sudden when they were in negotiation with um, colonizers who were coming in to deal with their land. Um, when they could videotape what the people were saying so that they couldn't later say, well, wait, no, we never said that, um, it, it changed the dynamic significantly. And that often it's the simplest uses of the technology where some of the most powerful pieces can come out. Um, yeah. I'll stop there. I, I, I'd like to throw this out. The other day, I was reading a devastating article I can't even remember about what. Devastating. I finished it. I, I looked at the time. I started scrolling. Now, this is something very simple, but as to your point about the flashing lights, um, what's happening to my brain here? I, I'd love to jump in on this one. Uh, I think I have a lot of, of similar thoughts to Daniel, and it's actually been a term that Daniel used in our first meeting of augmented intelligence that I've really come to enjoy and, and like here. Because I think that Naomi Klein really does hit on something here, which is that these technologies are powerful, but if we don't use them well, they really won't solve any of our problems. And going off of what Daniel was speaking, is that if, if we allow people to use AI to undermine our cognition and undermine our ability to understand the world and determine what is real and what is artificially generated, then it's going to be really tough to solve any problems at all. But I think that there's a flip side to this here, and I think this is what Naomi Klein misses, is that if we can only imagine the corporate dystopia, this is what we will end up with. This is the path that will go down. And I think this is the challenge is, is can we create a positive vision here and start marching down that path? And I really like augmented intelligence as, as a way of thinking about this, uh, is that if we have a way of, of centering this technology back on the human and saying, no, this, this isn't artificial, this isn't replacing humans, this isn't replacing our connection with you know, a, a robot lover, 
this is trying to augment our connections with others. It, it's in a way like I've heard it free, as creating an exocortex. You know, how can we um, actually extend our cognition and develop AI in a way that respects our psychology and respects our needs? And I think that if we can do that, we can end up in a really good place. But if we can't, then we might end up in a really bad one. I'll leave it there for now. Um, I'm going to jump in with something. I was listening to a podcast with Layman Pascal and Fionn Wright. Um, I really enjoy their work. And so to be able to explain this, there's a body of work on called adult theory, adult um, development, theory of adult development. There's been lots of research that we as adults go through increasing stages of complexity. And um, there's a particular stage called, um, so I can go through them. There's like a tribal time and then there's conformist time where you just kind of want to follow the rules. We can do this as kids, you know, we see then there's something called the, um, some people call it rational achiever or some people call it the, um, there's different stages for that where it's like, we're in this rational world and, and we're also, you know, understanding systems from that way, but maybe not the needs of our communities or even inside ourselves. And then there's another stage where we start to be like, hey, I'm a human being. I have deeper feelings. I have a soul. I want to express that. And there's other people in the world who are different from me and I want to get to know them. And then it goes into like more, more and more ability to hold all of that. So anyways, there was this researcher who did what's called a sentence completion test of AI, where you take the, um, you actually analyze where something's coming from, what place of consciousness they're coming from based on how the language is being constructed. So it's not the content of the language, it's how the words are put together. So um, as people grow in complexity, there's a certain complexity of language that develops that can even become more elegantly simple at, at a later time as we move towards elegance, you know, as artists will know, um, it gets messy and then there's a lot and then it kind of, but um, so what she found was that AI language was at rational achiever. And so I find this interesting in the sense of how this shapes us, because let's say there's a certain, you know, part of the population that are there. When I, when I read things that are produced by AI, I, I was sensing this but I liked seeing the data. It wasn't meeting me, like the language. First of all, it feels very masculine to me. And it also, which isn't bad for all you men out there, you know, but it it's not. So what do I need AI to do? Do I need it to mirror me perfectly? No. Um, and there's this thing of, okay, the language comes out at this particular place, but it's actually better for us to not be stuck there <laughs> because at, at later stages, we, we start to feel more nuances. We start to feel complexity. We start to feel more things. And so if we're reading a lot, taking in a lot at a language that is not as life-giving for many of us as it could be, I think that's, that's, I don't know whether to be concerned about that, but that was a red flag for me. I was like, okay. It's like, it's like looking at art all over the place that's like subpar and you start to like web three art is so, I mean, you just look at it and it's like what some of it isn't, you know, I'm sure there's good web three art, but people doing like um, tokens and stuff for their art pieces and NFTs. It's like, you know, I've showed it to some artists and they're just like, oh my God, like, what are they doing? And so then we get used to eating junk food. And so what are we, are we really feeding us? What are we feeding ourselves? So if this is going to augment me. I want it to augment me in a way that makes me feel <laughs> augmented. <laughs> and I'm not exactly sure what that would look like. And I think there's a risk of at the same time, I don't want it to feel human because I don't want to ever get caught in that trap of like my brain starting to get confused and thinking this is another human being. This is supporting me with something. So what is the right level of language and support? Like kids with tutors are gonna be having AI tutors, I'm sure of it, to help them hone 
things, those tutors, and I've got a son, you know, I'm like, I want, I would want that tutor to clearly be some augmented technology to my son, not, not an experience of a maybe human, because that sends us, you know, psychologically down all sorts of um, rabbit holes. Larissa, you just open Pandora's box. I knew Ned was going to want to respond, please. I have some good news and bad news. The good news is the art's going to get much, much better. The bad news is the AI is going to get a lot more human-like. You like, every, everything you're saying makes total sense and is a proper critique of the current situation. But when I look at what was being outputted a year ago compared to this year, and then I project that into next year and the year after that, could be could be still awful, or it could be mind blowingly good every second. You know, I don't know. We'll see. Good point. Yeah, good point. We'll see. Yeah, <laughs> I'm know? doing it. I'm like saying this based on now, this moment, this second, which is going to change tomorrow. <laughs> it's like well. Yeah, or, or, you know, but or maybe a lot yeah. in a year, you know, I don't yeah. know. It, yeah. it's, going, it's changing fast. I mean, I was, I, like I said, I've been super frustrated. Last night, I was, I wanted to try something. It just really was very poor, terrible, terrible um, image generation. And I just said, screw it. I'll take a real old school photograph. But I knew in my head, I knew, okay, you're frustrated now. But next year, it's going to do a great job. You know, it's just a question of time because it does, it does keep, getting better. I find myself wanting to to jump in right away with an, ooh, here's a thing that I'm thinking, and also recognizing that I always feel that way. And so I'd like to see whether Ahab or Nick, if either of you have anything that you'd like to share. Nothing here at this point. I'll, uh, I'll jump in, because um, I also always have something to say. <laughs> um, I'll bring it back to Naomi Klein's article. Um, uh, some of the things I see on one hand, I think like some of you, some of the analysis um, I resonate with, um, in particular, how I think she frames that there is the technology itself. And then there's the fact that we're, if we, if we were to think of the technology as a power multiplier, um, we're putting it, we're throwing it out to everybody um, in a world that really has some vulnerabilities and has people and ecologies that are really at risk. Uh, and a lot of things could happen very quickly and a lot of people and ecologies and could get really hurt. Um, and it's it's not happening at a pace where as a society, we have a lot of time to, uh, to think all that through. Um, and it's not being done by a group of people who uh, represent uh, all of those people in ecologies, um, and particularly don't represent the people in ecologies most likely to get hurt. Um, so there's really, if a billion people die, it's you know, um, we, you know, we can we can look at the world and think, okay, well, it's probably less likely to be these people and a lot more likely to be these other people. Um, and I, I would like more of those people to be on the on the boards that are making all the decisions. Um, so some of that analysis is really good. Um, and at the same time, in her article and in her other works, what I see is some uh, rhetorical ideology that I don't uh, resonate with very much. Um, I she uses a lot of language that's very inflammatory. You know, attacking. This, you know, besieging, um, it's a lot of warfare terminology and a lot of it comes out of what I've seen before in like sort of certain Marxist camps where it's like the, the CEOs and the wealthy people are the bad guys, the working class people are the good guys. Everything's a fight between those, the wealthy people, they're empowered and they all their decisions are conscious decisions and it's all happening to the working class people. And I just don't believe that. I think it's much more systemic. I think um, the um, agency is a lot, uh, isn't distributed that way. I think some of those wealthy people are, they were constructed by that system. 
Um, and I, and in general, this is what concerns me. I go on tw AI Twitter and I see what the experts are, you know, are writing. And it's become this rhetorical battle where people are digging their feet in and just beginning to say really silly things because, you know, um, you know, uh, Jan Lacoon says something kind of extreme and then somebody else, they go even further in the other way. And then this other person says this thing. And then it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, can everybody just take a breath and um, come out of that a bit? So what I'm looking for is people who uh, are skeptical of sort of partisan language and are skeptical of um, that kind of rhetoric, um, because that's, that's who I want to talk to. And I think those are the people who are going to come up with the sensible steps forward. Yeah, so... In short, some of her analysis is good of the problem, but implicitly uh, there's things of, about her ideology that I just can't resonate with. So I'd, I'd love to jump in again here. Please. Okay. Uh, this is where I come back to that augmented intelligence term. I really, really love it because I think not only is it descriptive, um, as like it, you know, it reflects that these things are are more more of a reflection of humanity than than a creation in themselves. And second, I think it gives some of that moral guidance for us as well because it starts allowing you to ask those questions of how should we be developing this. This is kind of a, a response to both Nick and Carissa here. Um, and I'll, I'll start with like a little case study I've been working on with teachers. You now teachers are really scared of this technology or worried because students might write essays with it, right? And they're saying, oh, but you know, that's going to shortcut the thinking process. We don't want to be able to do this. Um, and what I've discovered is that as part of these, these GPT technologies in particular, you can enter more than just the user prompt. You can also give system instructions. And this is where I think the power to the users really comes in, is that I can imagine a world where people are kind of the, the rule setters for their own AI. So for example, you might give, be able to give a teacher this thing and say, okay, you get to set rules for how this thing behaves with your students. If you don't want it to write essays for them, you can input a rule that says, well, you know, if a student asks you to write an essay, then you should kindly decline and, and instead maybe help them like a teacher would. And I think that if we gave this ability to everyone who is user of this, then they would start to be able to almost advocate for their own interests in how this system should behave rather than it being kind of, you know, pushed down from on high by the company itself is, is actually allow individual users to do this. So hopefully that means that, you know, you can allow it to nourish you in the way that you would like it to. If you say, well, I don't want junk food, I don't want junk information, I don't want you to behave this way you as the user might be able to go in and customize and set it in natural language as well in a way that is really accessible to everybody. And it doesn't just have to be English either. This, this can work in, in all languages. And I'm really excited about that as a potential positive solution here in this space. Wow. There's, there's something powerful about having to make explicit those biases of how you want it to work for you as well as an opportunity for reflection, as well as being able to see, like, I would love to be able to, you know, um, take something like a replica and be able to poke, look under the hood and say, like, so what are your system messages? What are the things that you have been told to do in terms of how you are responding to people? Um, two quick parts that pop to mind for me. One is around, around language and Carissa, that I really like the piece that you're talking about in terms of language and even just the structure and nature of language and how, how we tune into that and how that then shapes how we think and how we act and how we're doing things. Um, I think about um, in yoga, um, you know, uh, Patanjali sutras are right at kind of the, the core of a lot of pieces there. And one of the when he's describing different modes of thought. One of the, the modes of thought he describes is verbal delusion, where words don't correspond with reality. And one of the things, I mean, similar to, to sort of Maya in, 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 in Buddhism, the effectiveness with which large language models can powerfully weave compelling, coherent, and consistent at times um, webs of language 
um, that may or may not have anything to do with reality, um, but that that even when they do, um, the more we tune into that language approach to what things are and to a, to, a, to a generated language approach, and especially Carissa, as you say, one that's maybe coming from not as advanced a place as where we come from as mature humans in, in, in what we're aiming language at and how we're doing that. Um, that, there, that. There's a danger that comes from becoming too enamored of and too pulled into that gravitational pull uh, linguistically of something that is all about language. Um, the, the, the flip side of that and the thing that, that I love, so yeah, when, when we point it to language um, rather than what's beyond the language, um, to, to share from, from after our last session, I think it would have been, or, or actually it was a different session, uh, but last Friday talking with the, the grade sevens that I'm working with, the, the piece that I love is that rather than it being, here's what the AI tells you you should do, it's putting on an audio recorder when they say it's okay. Some of the groups weren't comfortable with that and definitely respect that. But for the ones who we say, you know, we're, this is what we're gonna do with this and they're interested in that, we just let it run. And it's all about them expressing their ideas. And rather than being caught in that language piece, it's them getting excited and then and not worrying about coherence, not worrying about um, here's how I linearly structure my thoughts in a way I would present to a teacher, but instead saying like, this is the stuff I'm really excited about. Maybe we could do this and this is what this piece looks like. And, and what about this? Um, and then being able to have what the AI does is just kind of hold all of that to take the linguistic castings off of wonder, enthusiasm, and inspiration, and then put them together into a shape that can help facilitate what that wonder and what that inspiration was about. And I think that the more we do that, the more we, um, and again, not to, I, I tend to dive off into, into, into myth and esoterica, but, but yeah, you know, in, in um, Kabbalah, you also have this piece of the, the, the clip off, which are the, the shelves, the outer shelves of things, and the, the danger, the evil that can be there when what you do is get obsessed with the outer layer and the shell of something rather than being able to understand what's its real nature. Um, and we're, we're great at that as, as humans. We're really good at, um, at pigeonholing things and figuring out, I know enough about this thing that I have some kind of a handle on it and then not digging in deeper. And so looking at how do we use these tools rather than weaving ourselves in an extractive way out into the outer shells of what understanding looks like and into abstraction, how do we use them to help us drill down into those, and especially the non-linguistic insights. That's what I'm really interested in. How do we use large language models and things like that to weave language around the non-linguistic intuition and insights and understanding that we have uh, in a way that doesn't overly damage um, what, what comes out through there. And I, I ramble a lot, so I'll step back. Oh, Daniel. Hey, um, I can listen Daniel, to you. your rambling is beautiful. Um, your rambling you've is prompted beautiful. me. But Brenda, sorry, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to, uh, well, there's so much, but I'll, um, I recently met with a couple of AI specialists, uh, data scientists, and we were talking about story time. And so you guys know story time is the storytelling template at the village. And we, it, it can be customized um, depending on the group that is meeting. Um, and she said towards the end of our, one, one of these uh, people said, um, what about using AI? So, so basically what happens in story time is that um, everybody shares a story around a common theme. And we really very organically and naturally weave our stories together. And um, so she said, what about if the AI could at the end of the session, weave all the stories together in a very concise way? And to that, I, I got, I could feel myself tingling with possibilities around that. So I was excited by it, but at the same time, uh, story time was, I, I developed story time without knowing what I was doing. It was just based on my creativity and curiosity. Um, and when I started working with people to break it down into a curriculum so we can help teach people how to do what I do, one of the things that I had no idea I was doing was towards the end of every gathering, and Ehab was at many of those gatherings, so he'll probably remember, I would just be so the Yiddish word is for klempt, like just 
overcome with emotion from all of these stories and the way in which they're all intersecting and we're, we're moving from being an individual into being a collective, I would just burst out, my heart would burst out, my mouth would open and words would come out and I would say, guys, would you know what just happened here? And then I would start. So I am really, really interested in how AI can take all our human experience like that through our words and the sharing of our stories and start to see the patterns and wind them together. But what's that gonna do to my mind? What's that gonna do to my imagination? What's that gonna do to my heart? How is that going to make me lazy? I, I, just, I just don't know. Um, Patrick, did you wanna? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, that brought up something else, uh, but I did wanna respond to uh, Daniel's prompt uh, provocation. Uh, because language was mentioned and Patanjali was mentioned and Buddhist concepts were mentioned. So I, I feel uh, that my best response to uh, Naomi Klein's article is to start like this. Uh, as a cyberneticist, no, hang on, hang on. Uh, as a systems thinker, no, wait. Uh, as a meta, no, hang on. Um, as a meditator, wait. Wait, okay, there's a problem here that Naomi Klein has brought up, which more of us need to engage in. And that is challenging the language that describes machine learning. Even that, even what I just said, machine learning. Wait a minute, where does this come from? And then we go back in time. So how do you respond to this? Um, I'm, and I'm, I'm not, specifically looking at you, Nick, who did a history of AI, although I'm very curious about it. But here we go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just quote for a moment. And I want you to tell me, based on your systems thinkers and your, your memory, and I'm going to trespass Reed's boundaries here of, uh, of cognitive systems. Where does this come from? Uh, human minds and modern digital computers are species of the same genus. What? Wait a minute. Namely, symbolic information processing systems. Both take symbolic information as input, manipulate it according to a set of formal rules, and in so doing can solve problems, formulate judgments, and make decisions. Thank you, we have solved human intelligence. We've compared it to machine intelligence. The human mind is like a computer, right? Right? Who, who are you to answer that in your experience? AI hallucinates. <laughs> really? And I think that's the importance of Naomi Klein's article. For me, from a systems thinking, from a meta level, he's challenging the very foundations of the language that has become established and common in how we speak about artificial intelligence, which I think that alone is fantastic. It is artificial. Intelligence is questionable, unless we're saying intelligence equals a parrot mimicking um, words, phrases that it's pre-trained on. And that intelligence um, is based on how a machine spits out content without understanding the underlying meaning of that content. Whoa, there's some problems here. And Naomi Klein has surfaced them. For me, again, because I think that there are earlier thinkers who have done that, and I praise them, because it's that very language that I think we can fall quickly into a trap about. And so that's, what, that's how I wanted to respond <laughs> to your provocation, Daniel. On language. Ned. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to go back to the Naomi Klein article, but only because I think that there's another thing that I thought uh, could have been mentioned 
And that's uh, open source because maybe the article was written before what I'm about to say came out, but um, there was a an internal memo from Google that was that was leaked or maybe it was leaked maybe on purpose. I don't know. But basically it was something about how they felt the people that that were discussing this within Google, they wanted to let the, I guess the heads know that um, there is no moat around Google, that its information is not going to be protected, and that ultimately open source is going to win out over all the private companies um, because it's more adaptable, because it calls upon a greater pool of resources. Um, yeah, because it's free and it's and it's available everywhere. And so I think that that if there's a silver lining or if there's a, if there's a hope, um, it is that um, there is a chance that even the big tech giants are going to be surpassed. Now I say that, but maybe not Nvidia, because I don't know how you do how you open source hardware. I don't know yet. I don't know. I don't know. But man, I wish I would have invested with them. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I digress. But. Um, Honestly, uh, I, I you know I, I find I find that very I find that hopeful. I, I think that uh, the genie is out of the bag, and um, you know for, I, for the talk of of using copywritten pre-existing um, data sets, I will let you know that uh, there are a number of of uh, companies, individuals, and groups that are using. Uh, copyright free data sets to train their their AIs uh, the model uh, to, to use as models and more interestingly I find for whatever it's worth now maybe it's going to be just hallucinatory stuff but you've got AIs who are producing data sets for AIs I mean so I don't know but I I, I do think that uh, it's going to be hard for even the really big giants to hold on to the genie I think the genie is going to be multiplied and shared across the world. Yeah, and, and with just, just quickly, but on that open source side, both how critical it is, but part of the beauty of it is because there's so many different layers involved in this kind of AI. There's the pool of training material. There's the model itself that you use. There's the training of the model. There's the prompting that you do of it. There's the end product that you make from it. And being able to have full transparency on what each one of those levels look like is such a deeply powerful thing. Agree. I'm I'm going to come in with the importance of education outreach here because I I think this is one of the most important tools we have, especially with some of these open source. Uh, I'm really hopeful about the future of open source. I, I really hope that this is the future. And I think that if we can educate enough people, especially being mindful of the huge digital divide that exists both in our society and between societies here, is that if we can educate people on how this works, we can educate them on the open source things, um, then people will actually be able to grab some of that power themselves and, and create systems that work well for them. Um, in particular, I want, want to go to, like, to Nick's point earlier about like how Klein said this article with, with a very specific tone of voice and how you know, Daniel and, and, and Carissa were talking about you know, these almost like evolutionary hacking that we see of people all the time. I'm imagining like being able to create your own almost antivirus system that is made out of these art. Um, these AIs where when you read an article, you know, it pops up and says, hey, you know, there's a lot of really specific language that's used in here that seems like it's, you know, it's either angry or, or kind of has like a conflict um, side to it. Um, or even other things like just being able to represent voices that you don't normally hear and have them um, artificially actually inserted into your idea. I loved the Lorax as a kid. And I've always loved this idea of having something that can speak for the trees and having something that can speak for things that don't have a voice. And I'm really hopeful that all of these components can start coming together in this open source world. And for me, the question is, well, how, how do we get this going? How do we teach people how to do this? People are terrified of computers. They're terrified of, comp of coding. Um, it's a really big barrier to get over. I think these systems can help. 
that was like seven ideas in in a couple of sentences there. So I'm going to th throw that back out to people. I'll just say how much joy all of those different pieces spark for me, Reed. And for for those who are interested, we are we're in the early fumbling stages of putting together a working group um, of people who are looking at through and beyond our conversations, like what are the things that we make? How do we set precedent and allow people to experience it in such a way that the, those positive futures this can potentially allow for um, happen? Um, one of the things in the, the, the ways that we can get, you know, that consciousness hacking side that you mentioned, Reed, and the ways that can be used for ill, one of the projects that, again, early stages of tinkering, and, and I think this could be a fun one if, if you want to play with me on it sometime, there's a glorious map of different cognitive biases uh, that I love. And one of the things I want to do is to make um, a philosophical anechoic chamber. So rather than an echo chamber that simply tells you what you want to know, making something that you go into and you spiel and rant all the different parts of your worldview. And then what it comes back with is, here's some places you may want to challenge yourself a little bit, whatever you happen to say, whatever, wherever you are on the political spectrum, whatever your framework, having something that can gently nudge you and say, here's some places where it seems like either maybe there's some inconsistency or here's some places where maybe some of these biases are at play or here's some key questions you may want to ask yourself to challenge that view, not in order to, in a Cambridge Analytica style way, guide people into a certain direction, but simply to guide us into thinking more and challenging our own assumptions. Oh my God, the, I love that. I love that. It makes me think as a writer, it makes me think uh, it's like bringing, you know, synonyms and antonyms into the 21st century. That I, I think that's a really brilliant fucking idea, Daniel. And I would, I would, I mean, just what good would that would do so much good for us. So we'd get what you know, we get the, the mirroring that we so crave because so many of us weren't loved enough. So we need to be seen and heard and acknowledged for the thoughts we have and the opinions we hold and the feelings we have but then to be to be challenged i mean that that actually sounds like an a really fun experience do you have a name carissa um, oops oh did carissa just had to leave okay yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. <clears throat> I, I think the name that I would use probably would be something like I'll come up with an acronym for Drax because I love the scene in one of the Guardians of the Galaxy movies where one of the characters has the a telepath who's there expose their secret desire and Drax gets lit up with delight saying, you just had your most embarrassing secret, it's, you know, it revealed to everybody, do me, do me. And that's what it is that you're trying to facilitate. My God, I, I, I don't Can know. Can I play devil's advocate though? Of course. Well, that's part of it. It's built in. Oh, who's guiding the guides? Who's guarding the guardians? What is happening to this da data that you're sharing with somebody so that they can help you and guide you along? Is that staying in your devices? Is that going somewhere else? Is that part of research? Is that research going to help a company make more profit? I mean, you know, that's the problem that I have with inviting uh, AI to help me tell deep fakes from fakes and uh, I, whether or not something has a, a hidden political or other pattern bias. That's the danger that I see, you know? It's like, ooh, uh, yeah, I need a guard dog that's going to be able to analyze me and pass that information on. That's it. And, and I saw... So, um... We have warnings on cigarettes. We have packages that have to say this is GMO food. We desperately, desperately need for things like an artificial intelligence system. And again, replica comes readily to mind. There should be an icon system so that you don't have to weed through a 400 page user license agreement to understand these are the things that this organization is allowing themselves to do with your data. This is whether it's going to be retained, whether it's going to be passed on to other people, um, or whether this is a system that's going to take in your information, do something with it, and then wipe all of that out. Patrick. Oh, wow. I have no comments, except. Oh, I thought uh, you did. Okay, you said you. No, you no, the whole, the, the, but the, the, 
yeah, all the, all those issues around privacy. Um, on Facebook, I'm 96 years old. I'm uh, a female, and I live in Mexico. Huh? That that's my response. So so uh, something that I was talking today earlier, and Daniel was in on this meeting, is how do you how do you codify honor? something that I've been thinking about, you know, like how do you, how can we use AI, you know, to invite us uh, to, to be our best self uh, and respect uh, the ability to listen, um, the, the ability to, to fulfill our commitments to show up when we say we're gonna show up. Um, yeah, I mean, sort of extrapolating here, but this one takes your data right. Um, and and another thing that I'm very interested in is exactly what Ned was saying, which is, you know, so if we're going to invite you to share deeply of yourself, what are we going to do with the data? What are we going to do with your answers? And so, you know, in my on my platform, I don't want those answers to go outside of the experience that they're part of. And so we're gonna to have to set that up and it can be done, am I right? It can be done. It's just that people do not choose to do it. But I think- Can be that done. We, pardon me? Can be done. Why? If it's being broadcast in any way, like YouTube, for example, the AI will just listen to it at eight times the speed and transcribe it all down. Yes, but I'm talking about on the platform. I'm not talking about- I'm just saying the minute that it's broadcast, it can then be captured just like, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't you couldn't protect music that was playing on the radio from being recorded on cassette tape, for example. If any of the of the exchanges that you have on a platform like and, and then it's put up on YouTube or any other kind of video platform to share with anybody, then it can be captured by AI. And then you have no idea about how it's going to be used, whether anything's going to be trained on it, whether it's going to be sold as part of a bigger package. Really, so the only way for it to not be accessed is not to broadcast it. But I, I think if it's right, Brenda, to the part that you're saying, not in terms of what might some other actor do with access to something or other, but in terms of knowing that the system itself that you're at, that you're engaging with um, isn't using that information for nefarious or overly capitalistic purposes. That part can be done, and yes. having local and, and this is like I'm, I'm 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 an evangelist for this having localized large language models which the organizations that are trying to use them for good are in complete control over and that they are transparent with their users about exactly how it works so that you can say if you're using this stream of things i mean the, my favorite clause is um when businesses will say um we retain the right of course to use your data to improve our services, which basically says we're giving ourselves permission to do whatever we want with this information um, and hiding behind vague language that sounds innocuous. Um, but, but instead to have something where you can say, absolutely, if you use this system, we guarantee that within five minutes or five hours after you've used it, all of that information will be wiped unless you have specifically asked for it to be retained. Um, but the, the other piece, Ned, that you're talking about um, is, is uh, in, increasingly something we need to just think about in terms of knowledge management. And I love that what this is, is essentially um, settler culture having to come to terms with what indigenous cultures have had to deal with for a very, very long time of what happens if people come in, take our knowledge, and then simply capitalize it and use it in a way that strips away the context doesn't serve ourselves, but also doesn't serve the actual wisdom that that knowledge is coming from. And there's so many places where I just, uh, it's its both nightmarish, but I kind of delight in the situations where all of a sudden, um, it, it was a, a great, um, I can't remember his name, I wish I could, presenter who was explaining um, Canadian indigenous history, who basically, who basically the way he summed it up was, um, modern Western scientific, I mean, science fiction apocalypse literature um, is, is, is simply white people recognizing what it's like to have the things that we often do to other people happen. 
Har Harold Johnson? What, could that be Harold Johnson? It, it could be. Okay. Ihab, you've been so quiet. I wonder if you have any reflections as we as we wind down and get ready for the summary. Catching up, just catching up, I'm fine. This is where I'm, I'm gonna keep keep beating the, the open source nonprofit drum quite loudly here. Um, I think that there's a lot of hope with, with small language models and not large ones. Um, there's been a lot of interesting research on things like chain of thought prompting, tree of thought prompting, like basically ways where instead of prompting something once, you prompt it and it runs like a hundred times and then gives you like whatever it finds is the best answer. I'm really hopeful that we're going to be able to get a version of this that you, you could run on your average gaming computer. Um, I think that as soon as you can do that in like any you know person who has access to like you know a thousand dollar machine, let's say, um, can actually run their own models in a way, run their own servers and are doing that. I think that alleviating a lot of those privacy concerns will happen in the next few years. We've already seen how like the performance of these models are going up. And I think that's the future is that it, it'll also be performant enough that people can run them themselves. Because I, I don't really trust you know, large corporations to run these things for me. I don't really trust my data in that. And I think if we're going to avoid some of the negative consequences here, we need to give people that control. That to me is the solution here. That's a beautiful uh, final thought. Daniel, would you like to take a crack at giving us a human summary? No, I am delighted with sitting with the, the <laughs> and difference and dissonance and waves of, yeah, constructive and destructive interference of the different trajectories and experiences and wisdoms that each person here is kind of sitting with. Um, and I think I would love to not try to summarize that. You just kind of did though, <laughs> despite yourself. Boiled again. <laughs> you guys, I'm gonna dig right into the heart just to say how much I appreciate you. I will say that um, a few months ago, Ned, who was on a tear of research into AI uh, was despondent one day. I have rarely seen him like that. And he said to me, you know, I think I'm going to need something, you know, to help as we move into the future. I think we're going to need something to help us cope. And um, I feel like this is this is the beginning of something to not only help us cope and survive, what is and what will be, but will also inspire us to thrive in any and every way that we can. And that's my wish for this group uh, and for all living beings. <laughs>